loved it. I'll send you a copy. Bam! Bitch went down. And welcome back to Horror Queers. We are talking about stuff. Yeah, there we go. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking lesbian reporters. We're talking alien abductions. And we're talking lingerie-clad nuns. I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking the best season of American Horror Story to exist up until 2019. Yes. I was worried for a hot second that you were going to try to make the argument that 1984 was the best one, and I was no, just no, going to no, have no. to shoot you and leave you as a ghost <laughs> in some deserted campground for a couple of decades. Listeners, if you have been following Joe on social media, you'll know you'll know that he and um, former guest Terry Menard of Gaily Dreadful have been uh, writing, re- oh, have been, they did write episode reviews for 1984, and um, Joe hated it. It was not our favorite. It was not our favorite. <laughs> I liked a lot of the people in it. I liked a lot of the promise that were a couple of fun twists but for the most part no i did not care for this season well that's why we're going back to asylum which some people love like me Mm -hmm. like me and you some people hate like dumb people people. who are wrong yeah (laughs) (laughs) um no but no so this is our second attempt to do do a tv show um if uh listeners were with us at the time we did do a british series called in the flesh back in the summer Mm-hmm. That was a bit easier, though, because we did the first season, which was only three episodes. So we did the three. We treated it like a big movie. This is a bit different. Yeah, there's 13 episodes. Luckily, I feel like most of our listeners have already seen this season because the gays love themselves a Ryan Murphy show. Wow, just broad generalizations there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Broad <laughs> generalizations. The gays, the lesbians, the bi's, the trans. Oh, I actually just meant that you're assuming most people have seen this show. Yes. I mean, granted, no. according to the ratings, um, that's not the case. But hopefully people went back and watched it. But we are just doing three episodes today. We're doing episodes four and five, which are both Anne Frank. I am Anne Frank, part one and two. And episode eight, which is Unholy Night, the Christmas episode. But never fear. If you haven't seen it, we will keep you up to date. And if you, ha- if you have seen it, but it's been since it aired in 2012, we will fill in the blanks um, for the episodes that we are not covering. This is true. Yeah. And we're also going to be joined by a very special guest, but she was only able to join us for a certain period of time. So we will introduce her shortly. And before we get too far into the mix, Trace, shall we have a conversation about a little something called Patreon? Yeah, no, no, no. So um, everyone may know that we asked y'all to do a listeners a listener survey a couple weeks ago, and we got a lot of replies, more, way more than I thought we were going to get. I would... Overall, say it's about 15% of our listener base filled out surveys. Pretty good. But there were a lot of um, people who didn't seem to understand what the Patreon was or how to access it. Which is fine. We had assumed that people were familiar with it as a concept. And, you know, we heard from a couple of people who said, I don't really know how this works, so no? Which has prompted us to say, oh, okay, well, perhaps we should clarify how it works. So, really quickly, and we'll, we'll, we'll make this quick for you guys so we can get to the Ryan Murphy of it all. Yeah, Patreon is basically it's a website where you can sign up to support artists, a lot of podcasts, some of it's just actual art or filmmakers or whatever. Mm-hmm. And in return for your payment, you get bonuses and rewards and benefits of whatever the artist deems necessary. We can't speak for everyone else, but for us, uh, we actually do give you bonus episodes and bonus mini episodes uh, every month. But basically, yeah, if you go to patreon.com slash horrorqueers, it'll pull up and you'll see all of our tiers, all the payment options, all the benefits you get for each payment option. I do want to point out that you do have to actually go to the link or Google Patreon Horror Queers, because if you actually just go to patreon.com and you search for Horror Queers, we're not going to pull up because we are an explicit podcast. And apparently, if you are an explicit podcast, you won't pull up in search results, which is really stupid. So we do have a bunch of different tiers and we tried to price point it out so that if you only have a few pennies, but you still want to support us, you can do that. And if you've got a little more and you want a little bit more content, then you can. We understand that not everybody's in a financial position to do that, and that's completely fine. We understand that sometimes people have more money in a given month than another, and you can come in and you can support us for a little while and grab a bunch of content and then be like, all right, I got a piece out. And that's also cool. 
part of the reason that we do this is because a we love doing the podcast and also b because we know that you folks want a little bit more from us every once in a while so we actually have an entire back catalog of conversations about new releases if you listen to the episode on the perfection that was an example of what you would get as a full-length episode so we do two of those a month we do two mini-sodes a month, and then you also get a newsletter once a month where we talk about the things that we're watching, and we talk about the schedule so you get to see it in advance. If you're totally cool with the free stuff that you get in the main feed, that's totally fine. It's not that we expect money, but it's just, you know, it's just something nice if you want to support us and show your love for all the hard work we do. Yeah. If you have up to $10 a month, so we're going to introduce a new tier in the new year, and you get an extra thing, so there will actually be even more content coming your way as of January. Mm -hmm. It works out to about a minimum of three hours of extra content every single month. And $10 a month, that's about three cups of coffee. That's the way that I've told people to think of it. If you're like, oh, I don't really have a lot of money. It's like, all right, do you buy three cups of coffee in a month? Yeah, that's about the same. If you don't, cool. Totally fine. In, in terms of how it works, uh, again, so different price points, different benefits. So when you actually sign up, you are emailed an RSS feed that you can actually put in your podcatcher. And therefore, whenever we drop a new episode on the Patreon, it will download immediately just like your regular episodes to your phone or whatever you listen to your podcast on. It's really, really easy and user friendly. Yeah. So now we have over explained the Patreon for you. Yeah. <laughs> if you do have any other questions, obviously, you can always reach out to us. But uh, we just wanted to help clarify how it works and what some of the benefits are. If you want to support us, that's great. We would love that. If you've got extra time because you're traveling for the holidays or you've got a little extra Christmas money, you know, it's always nice to support the people that you love. So let's move on. Trace, what the fuck is American Horror Story Asylum? I don't know how to answer that question, Joe. <laughs> it's, it feels so weird doing a TV show and also, like, again, just doing three random episodes of it. But, um, you know, American Horror Story Asylum is the best season of American Horror Story. And as many of my social media followers might know, this is my favorite one. And Coven is my absolute least favorite one. It is one of the more divisive seasons of the show. Um, it's probably the darkest one. And it is... Also probably the scariest season of the show, which is why it, you know, gets a little bit lighthearted uh, as the seasons go on. More, get more lighthearted, I guess, a little bit as, as the seasons go on. But um, I don't know. It's um, it's a real... Well, I'm glad you're having an existential crisis. What I was trying to cue you to say is it's an anthology TV show produced oh, like by said, Ryan oh. Murphy for the <laughs> FX channel. <laughs> so you wanted the real basic answer is what you're saying. Um, I mean, again, I don't want to assume that people necessarily know just because we do live in a media saturated environment. And just because we know who Ryan Murphy is doesn't mean other people do. True. Yeah. So if people don't know uh, American Horror Story. Yeah, it's an anthology show made by super producer Ryan Murphy. In this particular season, he also has Tim Minear, who is a really great showrunner on staff. And then he has his usual producing partner, Brad Falchuk, who... God, I want to say that their relationship is something like Eli Roth and Quentin Tarantino, but uh, I can't comment for Maybe? sure. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. I always get the impression that Brad Falchuk and Ryan Murphy, like, together, they indulge each other's not always great whims. And then I think one of the reasons for me that American Horror Story Asylum works is because Tim Minear is in there being like, hey, focus, children, we've got a story to tell. <laughs> Well, Let's structure this a little bit. I think, yeah, I think Ryan Murphy works best when he has... I mean, I started watching Ryan Murphy with Nip Tuck um, way back in... God, it was like re when FX really started becoming a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think Nip Tuck is probably what put FX on the map, actually. But I was still no, in high school when that... Shield. That's not Ryan Murphy. Oh, no, but it FX is FX. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think Nip Tuck started before The Shield, though. Uh, you keep talking. I'll look it up. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I was in high school when that came out. I remember my mom would not let me watch it because it was one of those, like, oh, viewer discretion advised, graphic sexuality, blah, blah, blah. And it definitely is. But that show, like so many Ryan Murphy shows, have a really good first season. And Nip Tuck's case had a really good second season. And then it's like he just stops caring or he goes away or something. And then the show is just turned to shit. So... When American Horror Story started, it was kind of a breath of fresh air because basically it was going to be a show full of first seasons because it's an anthology. So he wouldn't have to worry about maintaining the same through line. Of, oh, also, if you watch Glee, Jesus fucking Christ, Ooh, um, yeah. talk about a show with a great first season that just goes downhill after that. 
Well, and even further back, popular on uh, the WB network. So I didn't watch that, but I heard it was, I heard both seasons were good. No. Oh my God. The second season is a trash fire. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, this is where Ryan Murphy's, you know, his stellar reputation for having great ideas, okay, kind of Stephen King esque execution, and then he just absolutely loses interest in something. He moves on to the next project, and the first show yeah. just like torpedoes into the ground. And also to clarify, The Shield began in 2002, Nip Tuck began in 2003. Fuck me. Okay. Well, I never watched The Shield, but that's fine. Also, uh, plug for FX, Damages with Glenn Close and Rose Byrne and a million other guest stars. Really mm. good show, too. Yes. Which I feel like we've talked about at some point. But... I think we have, but I mean, I don't care. Okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, when, when American Horror Story started, it was like, oh, he's doing an anthology. He's never done this before. So it's going to be like a constant. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, I have to challenge again. You're doing revisionist history because people no. didn't know in the first season that it was an anthology. Well, right. So I think they announced it it was going to be an anthology after the first season ended, right? Yes. So when we went into Asylum, then people were like, oh, wait, okay, so this is a different... I remember people being confused in the first episode of Asylum, like, wait, these people are playing different characters. And then it's like, yes, because anthologies were still... They weren't new, obviously, but we hadn't seen an anthology horror show on TV in a very long time. That's really funny, though, because the first season ends with such a sense of finality. I mean, I say that, but then, like, there's a sequel episode in Apocalypse. <laughs> right. So it's like, eh. But, like, you know, it's like, where do you go from there? That was the thing. People were like, oh, my God, I don't understand. He killed all the people. How will the show continue? Because I think they already knew that it had been greenlit for a second season. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, but everybody just died. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we were such naive babies back then. Spoiler alert for Murder House, but yes, everyone dies. Oh my god, are we, wait, we're doing spoiler alerts? <laughs> so yeah. then, 53 episodes in. I don't know. We, we've done spoiler alerts before, but anyway. Um, so yeah, then Asylum comes out, in my opinion, a mu not a much better, it's a better season than Murder House, but yes. the ratings were... Not as good. I think it started off really well, but then as the season went on, like it kind of dipped a lot more than the first season ever did, because again... This season deals with some heavy subject matter that is not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and this is a very explicitly queer othered kind of season as well. So Murder yeah. House was just like, attractive people move into a really expensive Los Angeles home and weird shit happens. Like, it had kinky stuff, but it was, I don't know, it didn't have the same kind of tragedy associated with it like this is people in institutions it's partially inspired by a lot of like real cases where people were sent to asylums or sanitariums and they were treated really badly or they were experimented on mm -hmm. so it feels like season two has more of a historical tie to it that appeals to a broader section of people than just rich white people buy expensive house and get ass raped and as we'll discuss later, there is a lot of raping in this uh, season. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, yeah, I mean, it's it's not an easy season to watch, but that's also why I like it so much. Yes. Yeah. It feels like they're actually taking their subject matter seriously for a change. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, Coven happens. But, you know, I won't harp on that for too long. Yeah. No, I think we've established Coven's not your favorite. I know. <laughs> uh, it's okay. Maybe Emily will have thoughts on it. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay do you have any do you want to do the production stuff at all or are you good no i don't think we really need to i mean like oh which I mean, we can cut this out but did you see by the way the girl who wrote the first Anne frank episode is the screenwriter of a simple favor i did not is that jessica scharzer scharzer yeah but she also wrote the dirty dancing tv movie that came out like with oh uh oh god abigail breslin i think oh fuck is that really abigail breslin i Shit. think Maybe it's not. Maybe it's someone else. And then, yeah, Brad Falchuk is the writer of the second Am Frank, and he is married to Gwyneth Paltrow, which I did not know. Oh, I didn't know that either. Hmm. Yeah, they got married last year. Um, and of course, he works on every Ryan Murphy show ever made. Yeah, I swear, I'm like convinced that he's a lapdog, but whatever. Oh, 100%. So Emily's on her way. So before she gets here, why don't we go through a really quick plot synopsis, show? Sure, yes. I'll try to cover 13 episodes very quickly. I can do that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to like be chiming in too much. Sure. So, Asylum is set at Briarcliff Manor, which is somewhere in Massachusetts. It's not specified, but uh, this series sure. takes place in 1964. 
So the story follows two main protagonists, reporter Lana Winter, Sarah Paulson, and mechanic Kit Walker, Evan Peters. Because if you've watched any of the other seasons, you know that these two are Ryan Murphy mainstays. Yeah. Both of these characters have secret lives. Lana is a lesbian with a live-in girlfriend, Wendy, played by Clea Duvall. Mm -hmm. And Kit is married to Alma, who is played by Brittany Oldford. And she is a black woman in a time when interracial couples were, mm, let's say, not accepted. Well, and in some parts of the country today, still not accepted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah. We've come so far as the same <laughs> right? Yeah, none of the none of the issues that are being addressed in asylum are at all relevant nowadays. <laughs> Motherfuck. <laughs> okay. Early on, Kit and Elmo are abducted by aliens, but when Alma turns up dead, he is accused of being a serial killer called Bloody Face, and he is sent to Briarcliff for a psychiatric evaluation to determine whether or not he can stand trial. Lana enters under false pretenses. She suggests that she's doing a story on the bakery within the asylum, but of course she's actually there to find out more about Bloody Face. And what she actually discovers is that Sister Jude, another mainstay of the Ryan Murphy canon, Jessica Lang, is mistreating the residents, and that Dr. Arden, James Cromwell, is performing experiments on the patients. And uh, for this information, she is committed against her will. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, that's also something you could do back in the day mm -hmm. such fun inside briar cliff lane and no way too autocorrect let me try that again <laughs> lane <laughs> lane gender corrected lana inside briar cliff lana and kit meet fellow patients lizzie borden inspired grace played by lizzie brasher and nymphomaniac shelley played by chloe sevigny also on staff are the Monsignor, Joseph Fines. He's in charge of the whole... Well, I guess he thinks he's in charge. We'll put it that way. We also have Jude second-in-command, who is meek sister Eunice, played by Lily Rabe. And she becomes possessed by a demon saying, in the second episode. <laughs> she's, she's meek for a while. I will say that I forgot how quickly this season burns through plot. Yes, yeah. I remember her getting possessed and her being more sexy and assertive, but I didn't remember that it happens literally uh, in episode three. <laughs> yeah, it's really quick. <laughs> and then the final significant member of our cast is Dr. Threadson, played by Zachary Quinto, and he is a therapist who is eventually revealed to be the real bloody face. And the blood... <laughs> That bloody face. All these people have to say bloody face so many times, so seriously, and it mostly works, but I swear to God, the first time I heard it on the show, I laughed. My I was like, that is the stupidest fucking name. <laughs> bloody face. <laughs> yeah, it definitely feels like they're trying to map onto Leatherface, but we're not going to call him Leatherface because that would be too obvious. So we're just going to have somebody who skins people, you know, turns them into furniture and turns them into a face mask. And we'll just call him Bloody Face. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> you tuned out, didn't you? <laughs> no, I did not. What I was trying to get at was, did you like it when Adam Levine says it? <laughs> uh... I have cut Adam Levine out of this entire synopsis because I don't care. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, because he also isn't in any of the episodes that we watched. The only thing I remember of Adam Levine is when he is about to fuck Jenna Dewan, mm -hmm. nay Tatum, and <laughs> he, like, spits in his hand Ew, yes. to lube his cock up before he puts it inside her. Yeah, that and Brokeback Mountain. Spitting is not lube, people. It's really not, and it really bothers me when, like, things just slide in so easily with no. spit in movies. No, unless you're a porn star who's been working some kind of fixture to help things like open up or get excited a spit is not going to cut it no not at all Just or by lube could but it might actually cut it up yeah lube is expensive but a little bit goes a long way oh my god it's not even that expensive if you're having sex make the investment people have a good time i have a decent sized bottle of lube that i swear costs 50 dollars. wow look at you shelling out for the big money lube it's good lube but i mean like <laughs> Did I ever tell you the funny story about when I went to a party? It was admittedly a gay man's house. Uh, it was just like a random social thing. And we showed up and he had clearly cleaned, but he left this like two liter bottle of lube just sitting on the coffee table. <laughs> and we're like, is this a centerpiece? Is this an orgy? <laughs> Mine is not two liters, though. It's like a normal. But again, you only need a couple squirts of it and it's fine. 
This is true. Yeah. But like, yeah, I have like a, like, it's a normal size bottle and it's, it's expensive. Wow. Okay. Well, I'll just compare lubes. Now I feel bad about asking people to give us money for the Patreon because I guess they're <gasps> spending all that money on the fucking really pricey lube. Oh my god, everyone, let us know if you want a mini sode where Joe and I compare different lubes. Like, we'll go buy a set of lubes and we'll just test them out. and see, not, not like, you know, on our penises, but just like with our hands and we'll just like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you clarified because I was going to suggest, oh no, we'll do that when we start a YouTube channel, but I for sure no. am not doing that. <laughs> only fans. It's only fans. Right, okay, yeah. Support us on only fans. <laughs> Well, people people did say they wanted more nudes, and by more I mean any. So, right, yeah. Unless you've been secretly sending people nudes that I don't know about, we're probably not going to do that. My secrets out. Right. <laughs> so, over the course of the season, there are alien abductions, multiple torturous procedures, including caning, amputation, and electroshock therapy, and just for shits and giggles, we've got a musical number of the name game as Ryan Murphy. And if you haven't seen that, and that sounds kind of weird, it is, but it's really, really good. It's super fun. Yeah, if you have no plans to revisit this season, or you haven't watched this season, you can probably just YouTube it, but it's super fun. Yeah. Yeah. So the patients make several attempts to escape, and over time, we learn the stories of Arden, that he is a former Nazi doctor, and Jude, and we learn that she is a bar singer who turned to the church after she nearly killed a girl in a drunken hit and run. But for most of this season, she thought that she did kill the girl, and she finds out like in a late, 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 late episode that she did not actually kill the girl. Mm-hmm. But by then, it's too late. She's already been a nun for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, she, she, she went to the claw, even though she does get fucked a couple times. No, nope, once. Once in this show. Yeah, she's a bad nun. <laughs> <gasps> oh, my God. Bad what? nun starring Cameron Diaz. <laughs> <laughs> the spin-off sequel you never knew you wanted. Oh, that'd be so good. <laughs> <laughs> she gets, like, sentenced to the convent after, like, getting, like, arrested for, like, hurting a student at her school at Bad Teacher's. Academy. Right. And is Whoopi <laughs> Goldberg the... Uh... Yes! Yeah. <laughs> but then Tessa Farmiga's there, and she's no. like, you know... Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> no. I've canceled this already. <laughs> so the season concludes in the present day with a much older Lana. She is now a successful TV reporter and author, and she's giving an interview about her career. So as we get the interview, the segments catch the viewers up on the fates of both Kit, who had two kids from Alma and Grace, and then he died of pancreatic cancer, as well as Jude. She was rescued from Briarcliff after being committed, and Kit took her home, and she eventually dies from a brain tumor, but she gets to have a happy last couple of, I guess it's years or weeks. And finally, also the Monsignor who committed suicide after the allegations of abuse at Briarcliff are revealed. I was confused by this, though, because he does get crucified at one point, but he doesn't die from the crucifixion. Yeah. And then he kills himself later. Yes, correct. Okay, that makes sense. I forgot Joseph Fiennes was in this show. I totally forgot about this character. He's completely non-essential. That's probably why you forgot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we still have to wrap up the threads and stuff. So Lena also discloses that after she was raped by the doctor, she kills him in episode 10. She then gave birth to his son. She lied about it, but she secretly gave up the little boy for adoption. And in the finale, Johnny, who is now played by Dylan McDermott, who returns from season one to come back... Uh, not the same character, sorry. He, yeah. uh, he tries to murder Lena, but she shoots him in the face with his own gun. And... I think it's probably the best finale the show has done, too. It's it's, really it's a very good. satisfying conclusion. Yes, uh, which also sets up bad expectations for future seasons that do not nail their finale. <laughs> no. A lot of American Horror Story seasons, I always feel like if they if it had just ended with the penultimate episode and not had a finale, I feel like some of these seasons would have been improved like tenfold. Yeah. Well, I mean, I joked that he's kind of like a Stephen King in that he can't always nail the finale right yeah it's shockingly true over nine seasons it often seems like these shows just run out of creative juices or they overstay their welcome yeah absolutely yeah uh so that is your plot synopsis for american horror story asylum and i actually think that i hear someone knocking on the door of arden's death shoot oh who could that be i don't know maybe it's our special guest <laughs> So uh, we are lucky enough to have Emily Vanderwerf. Did I say that correctly? You did. Emily Vanderwerf. 
Excellent. Okay, so one of the reasons that we asked you to join us is because you used to provide coverage of American Horror Story and specifically Asylum back when you were working at the AV Club. Yes. And of course, now you're at Vox, but we're going to ask you to draw on your uh, great memory and help us out. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> God, memory. I was I was rewatching these episodes last night and I was like, because, you know, Asylum's always been my favorite season, but it was just like, I, I had forgotten. Like, I remembered most of what happened in this season, but like rereading the plot synopsis of the season, I was like, holy shit, there was so much going on. <laughs> yeah, I rem I, every time people rank the seasons of this, a lot of people rank Murder House or Coven ahead of this one. And I'm like, are what? you, because you lost it? No. no. Unacceptable. So, I <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Coven is my absolute least favorite season. Yes. I strongly hate it. I think it panders so much and it like showcases the worst of what like the Ryan Murphy brain trust has to offer the world. I feel like it really thinks that the queer community will like let sloppy storytelling slide if they just give us a bunch of bitchy like famous actresses. And <laughs> it, that's really <laughs> insulting to me. Which is hilarious considering how much you love Scream Queens. Well, no. Okay. But, but Scream Queens doesn't rely on like... It doesn't take itself seriously. Coven, even though it is like a more funny, uh, campy esque season of American Horror Story, like takes itself very seriously. Right. I think revisiting Asylum was really helpful for me because I just came off of watching 1984, which was just an abject failure on every level for me. <laughs> I had fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can see that there's fun, but just from a storytelling, from a performance level, from just continuity, it's it's a bit of a garbage hot mess. So coming back to Asylum and seeing, okay, there's still a lot of that DNA here, but just the pacing of it is so much more leisurely. And in part, my elephant memory problem was I had forgotten that American Horror Story ever had 13 episodes. Like yeah. this was a genuine surprise to come back to. Yeah. Yeah, they used to stretch that motherfucker out. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I do think, because I, mean, I feel like the thing with this season that everyone complains about is always like, because it's, it's a kitchen sink season, but like, I think the one aspect people were like, if they just would have gotten rid of this, it would have been better, and it's the alien stuff. And mm -hmm. I kind of agree with that, but I do think given the way the season ends, it mostly justifies its existence. But yes, would this have been better as a 10 episode season with no aliens? Sure. I think the I think you need the aliens. I really do. I think that every piece of this is necessary, even the pieces that don't work. Like the joy of asylum is that a lot of it is terrible, but it all fits together. And like that's the uh, ideal for a Ryan Murphy series, at least pre-American Crime Story. Since then, he's right. been a little more restrained, but pre-american crime story ryan murphy you want something that's occasionally terrible and in the end everything locks together right i agree with that i also think that the emotional like heart of of this season works really well and i think that's why i don't resonate with coven as much is because it just feels so hollow i didn't really like many of the characters in that show whereas like this at least you have sarah paulson in this season i, I don't really particularly give a shit about kit evan Peters' <laughs> character but like <laughs> It's fine. But like, I, I like him. I just I'd rather watch other characters in this show. Yeah, I think you're meant to find the romance between him and Grace, the compelling aspect of him. Like his wife has died. But at this point, he's maybe finding something new. And then of course, that gets complicated. And we end up in an odd polyamorous relationship, which I think is probably one of the first times I've seen that even on cable television. But for me, yeah, this this season is all about Sarah Paulson and the number of people who come back and talk about Lana Winters as one of their favorite Ryan Murphy characters is not surprising to me because I think Sarah Paulson just knocks us out of the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this is I was not I honestly was never a big Sarah Paulson fan for years and years and years. I read that in your review because yeah, this is back in 2012 when this aired and you were writing this. But yeah, I, you had written like I like she has not impressed me much until like up until this point. So I was like, oh, but I was trying to think like what had she done, and I couldn't think of anything. She had done American Gothic, and I will stand for American <laughs> Gothic. She was yeah, she was good in that. Um, I like was thinking about all those shows in the 2000s she got thrown into as the romantic lead for like uh, a group of guys you know like the matthew perry she's matthew perry's love interest on studio 60 oh, oh god right she's the lead female on the remake of cupid uh and just yeah, like that was terrible the original cupid was one of my favorite shows of oh, the 90s so and just like she was not in she the was lead no paula marshall yeah <laughs> 
Yeah. So I, uh, I definitely like didn't understand the appeal of Sarah Paulson. And then I saw Asylum and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I get it. Also, I'm a lesbian, but I didn't get that for a while. <laughs> Lana Winters makes me feel funny things. Why is <laughs> yeah. that? No, I, this is this is a total tangent, but I've been thinking about this because I saw um, the movie Portrait of a Lady on Fire, which is oh. so good and so sad and so lesbian and uh i just was like god all my life i've been really drawn to stories of lesbian romance and i was like oh okay all right mm. <laughs> i get it i do think too that in, at least in mainstream maybe maybe not mainstream but just i feel like because we were mapping out our 2020 schedule and like we were like putting all these films in and like for most january and february we were like oh we have all lesbians in this like there's so i feel like there's a lot more at least in the horror genre there's more lesbian stories or characters that you can come across than there are um trans or gay gay men or bisexual it's it's typically lesbian kind of like lesbian like there's one lesbians overflow <laughs> the yeah. media yeah yes the one lesbian has, yes has arrived <laughs> <laughs> arrived to be in the horror film um yeah that's an interesting point i mean ryan murphy's certainly doing his part to up the representation oh, yeah. of gay men in the, the horror space but well, as long as yeah. they're mostly white yeah yeah well <laughs> i mean well, it's yes but baby uh, steps for society joe <laughs> <laughs> i definitely like i definitely have the feeling that like obviously part of the reason lesbians are more common in horrors because it can be titillating and like yes horror is often sold on titillation but yeah a lot of my favorite queer women or queer women adjacent characters are, mm -hmm. are definitely from the horror genre mm-hmm if anything, it's proof that the genre, or depending on how much you want to water it down, subgenre, I think it lends itself well to these kind of portrayals, these kinds of characters, because you can be a bit more on the margin. You can well, explore some of those stories. I also think, though, so, I mean, we're getting better, but let's think about, like, what doesn't scare most straight men are lesbians, because lesbians yeah. are sexy. And if you have studios who are marketing horror films to men they're going to be okay with lesbians they're not going to put a bunch of gay men like having a bunch of anal sex in their film or tv show because it's it's not it wasn't as safe and it's still not quite there yet but as you said emily like murphy's doing his part to like make it better first of all thank you for pointing out that i'm sexy i really appreciate that <laughs> But I, I do think that part of it also is that horror fundamentally on some level is a tragic genre. So you can do here are some sexy lesbians and then you can kill one or both of them and have like that tragedy that loops in that like is part of cis hetero society's framing of queer narratives. So like horror just like lesbians and horror just fit together in that way. And I do think Asylum is interesting in how it sort of is subverting those narratives like I, it's definitely like definitely this is a big old tragic story about some tragic lesbians but like oh, yeah it treats it with an emotional reality that mm -hmm. i don't think it had really ever been treated before and paulson is so important to that it's true yeah i had forgotten so i actually i know that we're specifically going to talk about three particular episodes but i decided to go back and watch the first and the second as well as the finale just because i could not remember what happened and it's so unfortunate because a you got motherfucking Clea duval wasted in this role <laughs> uh, but it's like she and sarah paulson have really good chemistry they make yeah. for a fun sexy couple back in 1964 and then yeah she's literally dead by the beginning of the second episode and all i could think of was like oh are we still doing this bury your gaze trope? so wait did, did they because again you have to refresh my memory do they show her get murdered or do we know because because she's the opening sequence of the second episode so she like hears a sound in the house and then bloody face appears in the window and then gotcha. we see her body Okay. In episode five. Because when her corpse is revealed at the end of I Am Anne Frank part two, I thought that was like the big reveal. Like, oh, she's dead the whole time. But that makes more sense. Yeah, it's tricky because Lana obviously has not heard from her because Wendy helped <laughs> to commit her. So Lana's not feeling particularly generous about getting back in touch with her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. It's love. I mean, that's just, we're just duplicitous. That's just how it is. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so why don't we dig into these episodes? So I have a brief overview from the two-parter, and I feel like we should provide some context. So the reason that we specifically picked I Am Anne Frank 1 and 2, which is episodes 4 and 5 of this season, is A, because it's a bit of a good representation of the season overall. 100%. Yeah, like there's a lot of moving parts in this season, but you're actually getting a little taster of almost all of the storylines, as well as a bit of a standalone. So if you needed to kind of parachute into this mm -hmm. season, you could do these two episodes and get a good taster. And then, of course, we also have the... God, I just keep saying elephant in this episode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's because I'm still thinking about this week's Watchmen. But we've got the aversion therapy sequence, which is one of the most notorious sequences... I feel like in American history, American horror, Amer sorry, American, American history, history. <laughs> American history. <laughs> That's a bold claim. No, and, and so because the reason I like this season so much is because for me, it's the only season out of all nine seasons of this show to accurately like represent the horror in the show American Horror Story. And sequences like this, and maybe it's because I'm gay, so like it rings more true for me. Like, I mean, us, I guess, really. Yeah. This is a very unsettling season, and if you look at the ratings for this season, they did dip, like, not significantly, but quite a bit compared to the first season, and I think that's why Come went in such a different direction and tried to be more fun and frivolous, because the reception to this season was, like, it's too it's disturbing. Too dark. Yeah, it's too dark. Ryan Murphy got notes from FX saying, so are we going to have a happy ending in here? Like, the reason that the name game is in here is because Jessica Lang was like, hi, can I just do something a little bit fun for a hot moment? <laughs> My favorite. So good. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the other highlights of this whole season. But yeah, it is, it is dark as fuck, which... Mm -hmm. I appreciate as as a horror viewer, but also as a queer, I feel like this is also one of the only seasons that treats its horror seriously. It's not trying to be overly campy. It's not trying to be apologetic. You know, you've got the bloody face bullshit, and I feel like that's for the quote-unquote teeny boppers and the people who are just coming for the scares. And then you've got the real horror, which is like what's happening to these people inside the asylum. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I really, yeah, I, the, the the way that this plays around with actual queer history also feels like a precursor to what Murphy would do in American Crime Story Feud, some of his later work on FX, where he's like dealing with actual horrors in yes. American history. And like, for as much as I've liked other seasons of American Horror Story, this is the one where, yeah, he genuinely did feel like he tapped into something terrifying and i do wonder like we're, we're attributing a lot of that to murphy but like tim Minear, i, believe I was gonna in say charge. He, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was in charge of this season he's he's a really great showrunner like there are a lot of creative minds behind the scenes on this show that i think really made this season just like the peak of what the show was capable of and i do think that there was sort of this idea that they could alternate between the goofier seasons and the darker seasons that kind of ended with freak show which i think is another really dark season and yes. weirdly one of my favorites it's not yeah. it's a very minority opinion but i think yeah the consensus like people really hate that season i remember thinking it was fine like a lot of people like i mean the way people talk about freak show is honestly how i feel about coven so it's yeah. like i'm biased i guess <laughs> yeah there's a there's something to there's a power to when Ryan Murphy shows talk about groups of outsiders who band together and like yes. change the status quo, even if it's only within their minor communities. And Asylum is is really one of the first places he does that. Like the line between Asylum and the first couple seasons of Glee is not that bad. <laughs> like you don't have to go that far. And <laughs> uh, I'd love I'd love to see a mashup. <laughs> oh my god i mean we kind of got one in the name game i'm like you yeah. have to expect leah michelle to come out and start like push her off stage oh, <laughs> well I hold on it. to that idea for a little bit later okay. when we get to our game okay <laughs> okay so i'm gonna briefly read this uh overview of i am Anne frank because of course we're we're asking people to remember a show from seven years ago but also an entire season of television so yeah as always feel free to interject at any point so a new patient, Franca Patante, is admitted who identifies herself as Anne Frank. She immediately accuses Arden, Dr. Arden, played by James Comera. Who won an Emmy for this? And I, Shocking. out of all, all the people, out of all the people to win an Emmy for this show. Yes. 
yeah, he would not have been my first choice. <laughs> I mean, he's good. It's just like, you know, I feel like there's more standout moments, for standout roles. Yeah, uh, for sure. He had, a, he had a weak category that year, as I recall. It just mm. like there, He didn't have a lot of competition, and uh, a lot of these others were like competing against themselves. So uh, Okay. Wait, do you get your own category for TV, movie, or miniseries compared to... Yeah, okay, yes. so yeah, he won Supporting Actor in a Miniseries or Movie, and he there actually, Zachary Quinto was also nominated, and he beat, and Sarah Paulson did not win for this, and Sarah Paulson was in Supporting, and both of those are horrifying. Oh, God. Oh, category fraud. <laughs> it's such a real thing. <laughs> well, I guess maybe were they going for like an ensemble piece? Like, were there, was there anyone in this that was nominated? I guess maybe Jessica Lange was nominated for lead. Yes. Yeah, she was nominated for lead. Oh, wow. Sarah Paulson lost to Ellen Burstyn for Political Animals. I was all prepared to be like, oh, well, Jesus. but she lost us. No, <laughs> Ellen Burstyn. I mean, Jessica, I love Ellen Jessica Burstyn, Lang lost but... to Laura Linney for The Big C Hereafter. Oh, my God. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've only seen the first season of The Big C, and I liked I liked it fine, but like I heard it got worse as it went on, and so that's really upsetting. <laughs> I will say that this lost outstanding miniseries or movie to Behind the Candelabra, which I'm totally fine with. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. that's an okay one. Mm -hmm. So she accuses Arden of being Doctor Hans Gruber, a Nazi doctor from Gruber. the concentration camps. Is it Gruber? Yeah, it's really weird because I totally thought it was Hans Gruber at first too, like Die Hard, but it's Gruber, like the fish. Okay, I thought I had made a spelling mistake on my sheet. <laughs> okay, so John McClane will not be entering the picture is what we were saying. Nope. Okay. So this sparks Sister Jude's interest. Not only is Arden being investigated by the police for harming a sex worker, which is what happened in the previous episode. Not really that important. <laughs> but uh, Jude doesn't agree with his mysterious experiments or the way that he tries to circumvent her authority. So she hires a private investigator to dig up dirt on Arden. But when Anne Frank is revealed to actually be Charlotte, a housewife and postpartum new mother, Jude despondently runs off for a few drinks and a one night stand. It's the first of many times. And then Charlotte is given a lobotomy by Arden and she is turned into a Stepford wife. So that's happy. which. Okay, I, I was confused what you were doing at first. I was like, wait, you're going like you're doing like a whole plot line between the two. You're, so you're treating these two episodes as one episode, basically. Yes. Uh, originally, I had it. I had them separated. I had it kind of sequential, and okay. then it was about two and a half pages long and not interesting to read. And I'm not a surgeon, but I, I I was a little confused to how the lobotomy made her. I mean, a Stepford wife, like you said, like it, I always thought, again, I did not do research on this, but I thought lobotomies like kind of just made you like almost a vegetable. Yes. 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 That, I mean, like the dream was that they would make people like, like this placid, right? Like, yeah, it would make them Stepford wives. But uh, yeah, you start poking things into people's brains. It rarely ends well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, the same with electroshock therapy. You generally can't get too much of that and then come back from the brink. As opposed mm. to what we see here, where it's like momentary memory loss, and then you're kind of fine for the rest of it. Yeah, I'm just, I thought it was an interesting choice to make it like, oh, she's fine. Or maybe it was supposed to be like her, in her mind, she was fine. Or I don't think so. I, I mean, it, it was an odd choice to be like, oh, look, it was quote unquote successful. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, a narrative shorthand. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, you know, it's definitely like this season is about levels of control. And like drawing lines between all manner of white men who wish to control, we should say straight white men. Yes. Sorry, gentlemen. All manner, of, <laughs> all manner of straight white men who wish to control anybody who doesn't conform to that stereotype by like, you know, uh, murder or genocide or rape or like whatever. And like that is why this season is so dark and scary because like it's literally like exploring every possible way that anyone who's not a straight white man but particularly women can be like destroyed by this system that just is casually set up to protect them mm -hmm. you know there's there's a political savvy to some of these seasons of this show that i think is is maybe not noted enough and like it's really one of my it's the one thing i like about coven is the way it depicts different interest groups like mm. fighting against each other instead of dealing with the real threat yeah, it's just unfortunate that it also falls into that pitting women against each other and just becoming bitches who lust for each other's downfall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't mind that. I just hate that there's no stakes in that fucking show. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it's the same problem with all the ghost seasons where it's like, well, if anybody dies, none of it matters. Whereas yeah. here, I feel like Asylum does a really good job of having these standalone episodes where people come in and we get to see the stakes of what happens to our protagonists if they're not careful. So in this pairing of episodes, we see both Kit and Grace at risk of being lobotomized. And then mm -hmm. we see the result in Charlotte, but we don't have to worry as much because we only know her for the two episodes. I did appreciate the stylistic choice to have her home life be represented like via TV camera footage. Like it was like, like I mean, I guess like a 1960s like Super uh, 8 or something. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice uh, artistic choice. Yeah. Also lots of split diopter shots, which um, is Gomez Rejon, uh, he used that a lot in that town that dreaded sundown sequel remake thing in the jig. <laughs> yes. This is him cutting his teeth before he goes on to do do films. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about Kit and Grace. So at this moment in time, they're continuing to bond. Uh, she reveals to him that she did, of course, Lizzie Borden, her father and stepmother, but it was actually because they were sexually assaulting her. And then they get down to some hanky-panky in the bakery, which is, ew, not hygienic for anybody. I mean, they have limited space to do this that, so yeah. I forgive it. Their options are not great. <laughs> so they get caught, they get sent to solitary confinement, at this point, Kit is rescued by Dr. Thredson, and he is convinced to confess to the bloody face murders on tape, which, of course, we discover there's a good reason for that. But uh, <laughs> it ultimately gets Kit arrested by the police because he is deemed fit to stand trial. And then Grace is going to be put into one of Arden's experiments, but she's abducted by aliens, and she comes back to the common room and begins bleeding from her lady parts as a result of suggested alien experimentation. Oh, yeah. things I get to read on this show. I feel like I should say something to that, but I'm like, yeah, that's par for the course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always wonder about these tropes that are like blatantly sexist or whatever, but do play off of like, for instance, the treatment of pregnancy in many, many horror movies is blatantly sexist, but also plays yes. into real fears women have about being pregnant, about having something inside of you that is like basically eating you from the inside that like mm -hmm. is you know it's so easy to tip that over into um into terror like i wrote a book about the x-files and so many of those episodes involve rape and like mm, often yeah. in really irresponsible ways but there are so many reasons that that is a terrifying thing for women to deal with now obviously the solution to this is to have women make some of these movies and like Jesus talk Christ, about their yes. own fear but, <laughs> but yeah like like there is a power to the tropes nonetheless even when they are in you know sexist areas Hmm. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I saw that a number of the reviews for this season were really divisive, like they were polarized almost, where there was a subset of people saying this whole season is about women being confined, being tortured, being raped, being murdered, being amputated, just all these terrible torturous things done to women and how it's super anti-feminist and sexist and just gross and vulgar. And then this other side being like, this season is filled with with strong, complicated, challenging women. And if you think about Lana's arc over the course of the 13 episodes, like she fucking prevails. She shoots two male serial killers in the face. <laughs> one of which is her son. One of which is her rapist and one of which is her son. Yeah. Well, th there is rape all over this season. I mean, not only with Lana, uh, Lana, but I mean, also like with alien probing anything, I guess, I mean, we can consider that sexual assault and rape. Yes. And with evil Ian McShane, Santa Claus. Yeah, there's a lot. It's pretty disturbing. <laughs> Rightfully so. Yeah. Okay. So let's get to let's get to Lana then. She realizes that she can't remain in Briarcliff because she's starting to have hallucination. <laughs> she's losing her mind. So she takes Threadson up on his offer to treat her homosexuality with aversion therapy. Now, in case people don't know at home, this is a real treatment that was done. It was practiced throughout the 60s. It was condemned and more or less stopped in the 70s. People may look at it and be like, oh, it's like that Clockwork Orange treatment. But uh, it was done to a lot of queers. There is a nice little bit of exposition where she basically like has to like tell threats and you know oh like according to whatever that manual is the DSM blah 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 I am considered like it's, I I am sick it's a disease you know it's not something that I'm born with just to catch up younger viewers who may not have known <laughs> that fact yeah because it wasn't uh, classified as anything other than an illness like a mental illness until the seventies. 
I mean, gender dysphoria, which I, you know, deal with, was uh, mm-hmm. classified as a, like, severe mental condition until, like, within the last five years. It's been, in, yep. the, in the latest edition of the DSM, it's been like, okay, yeah, this is a thing people can live with. And, like, whew. Jesus. So why do you think that is? Like, I mean, like, not saying, like, much progress has been made on either front. I mean, like, in terms of just, like, the general populace's thoughts on it, for sexual orientation to be... <sighs> Like, not approved, but, you know, moved off of, like, the illness list of the DS... I'm not, I'm not going to say it again, but that book. Uh, <laughs> but why, why do you think it took so long, then, for gender identity to get there? I mean, I obviously... I don't know, but, like, I do think that it is a little, like... You know, uh, sexual identity, to some degree, exists behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. Like, I yeah. have to live my entire... Like, I, I don't have to, but I do live my entire life presenting feminine. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how often people read me as a trans woman. Like, I I can't know that. It is a thing that is more obvious. And I think that it's harder for people to deal with it and adjust to it because of the fact that queer people throughout history have, well, throughout American history, I should say, have, like, traditionally lacked societal power, which leads to sort of this feedback loop of, like, more overtly and obviously queer people are discriminated against more which is true in you know both gay men and and lesbian women communities but Mm -hmm. like is especially true with trans people and i think it really is just sort of that like also there aren't as many of us like there are more gay and lesbian people or bisexual people or whatever than there are trans people and that's just that's just how it is so i do think it's it's a combination of all of those factors but it really is just kind of that lizard brain prejudice thing it's a lot easier to spot someone who is trans and have your lizard brain be like oh i don't like that and like that's rude and cruel and you shouldn't do that but like i can't admit it doesn't exist you know Right. It's it's like, I mean, even for just like gays, it's like, oh, I, I don't mind if you're gay. I just don't want to see it in my face. Yes. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think there's also an issue of passing. It's interesting in Asylum here that Lana and Wendy are both, they're both passing very easily as straight women because they adhere to the conventions of right. what they should look like, right? You know, if we had Lana or Wendy as like a big bull dyke, you'd have, a, I think, a harder time believing that they could become school teachers. Or so if it's orders. like Sarah Paulson and Dot Marie Jones, it would be like a little bit harder in the, in the, the 60s. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And like, that is a thing that I, I, I struggle with sometimes as a very conventionally feminine trans woman and i i don't want to say i pass easily but i i more or less pass in most situations i get into in my day-to-day life and Mm -hmm. like i do struggle with that because a lot of my friends are not like that and they often really struggle and like struggle with societal prejudice and like i'm not gonna say i don't encounter it ever but like i do have a degree of comfort that they don't have and i wonder how much of that is me And how much of that is me being like, well, I don't mind dressing this way, so maybe I'll just, you know, give society what it wants. I think it's Mm. more me. Like, I like like to wear dresses. I like to do that sort of thing. It makes me feel good. But there is that constant push and pull, I think, in all queer lives between, like, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because society is going to treat me slightly less shittily? Yeah. Anyway, then there's a murder (laughs) Santa. (laughs) Fun times. (laughs) Well, first we have to continue with our aversion therapy, unfortunately. Oh, right, right. So, which went on a lot longer than I remembered it going on. Right. Yeah. I always forget that there's a guy who gets introduced. So first, yeah. Lena is made to be physically ill, and it happens every time she looks at sexually suggestive pictures of women, including Wendy, which I just thought was so oof. That's the moment that kicks me in the face. Knowing, I mean, because even at this point, like you kind of suspect that Quinto is going to be bloody face, but it, like knowing then what he is and how he's fucking with her specifically, it's just, it makes it even more disturbing than it is on the first time viewing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Then he introduces a man that she's made to touch. So you're, you're meant to assume negative sickly feelings when you have homosexual urges and then you're supposed to equate pleasure such as masturbation with the feeling of heterosexual contact so Mm -hmm. icky all around well and the look of horror on her face when he comes in is just blah blah yeah yeah 
I'd love to put some like really brotastic straight people through this process and see how they feel about it. Oh, oh wait, isn't that just groupers? Never mind. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, there's. Uh, I mean, obviously, trans people have their own version of aversion therapy, and mm-hmm. like, I just like, oh my god, cis people, we, just, we could make you wear a dress if you'd like to see how it feels, and mm-hmm. you don't want to do that. But like, ah. Uh. I was always very strongly affected by scenes of aversion therapy, which turn up in a handful of things. And mm-hmm. just was like, I, I felt like intense revulsion at them. And that was bef- like, I covered the season before I was out to myself even. Right. And just like, yeah, some part of me like knew <laughs> there was the part of me that was running scared from if I had come out as a trans woman in my tiny little town full of conservative Christians, I would have been sent to a camp that did something like this to me. And like, yep. yeah, 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 yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Sunshine and rainbows. Right. <laughs> Whose pick was Asylum again? <laughs> uh, so anyway, so this procedure obviously fails. And then Threadson decides to sneak her out of Briarcliff. He takes her home in secret. And this is when she discovers that he's basically Ed gaining women. But this whole sequence, the, the reveal of the nipple lamp is like, which I had totally forgotten about is so clever and just so creepy. I, ugh, and the, the skull candy dish. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah. Ugh. And the fun thing is, is I was only half paying attention because I was like taking notes and doing some other things. So I wasn't even seeing that stuff until she actually stumbles into the room and she just oh. sees like skin flaps. And then when you messaged me and was like, ugh, the nipples on the lamp, I was like, wait, what? Say what again? It's intense. <laughs> uh so of course threadson is now revealed to be the real bloody face he drops her through a trap door he walks her in the basement with the body of her former lover and that's i am Anne frank one and two <laughs> <laughs> i do want to say i was glad you picked these i think these are the high point of the season i think that there are other really good episodes in this season but i think that these for me were when i was like do i like american horror story like am i into this show (laughs) wait am i a fan all of a sudden (laughs) yeah (laughs) well i know people tend to like murder house a lot and i think murder house is fine but i remember even when i was watching it which i guess would have been back in 2011 like i was like "Eh, that's fine i don't really like tessa farmiga so like all the stuff with her i was just like not really into this season sealed the deal for me i was looking though at the reception like of episode by episode and most of it was all like not overwhelmingly positive but mostly positive except for the penultimate episode episode 12 had like the lowest score out of all the episodes this season i don't remember what happens then but it is a severe dip in quality apparently so i can tell you it's basically a placeholder episode it's all about kit and elma and grace and elma Ah. goes crazy she kills grace she gets sent to briarcliff and then she gets killed or she dies there there's a lot of um getting out of Briarcliff and then getting sent back to Briarcliff and then getting out of Briarcliff and then going back to Briarcliff. Yeah, that I think is one of those things where had this been nine episodes or ten episodes like the current seasons have been, I think you would have cut down a lot on that. Mm-hmm. Well, you didn't like 1984 and that was nine episodes. So what the fuck do you want? Uh, because they did not have enough story to justify. Even those <laughs> garbage. That was a garbage season. Ugh. To each their own. Uh, do we have anything else we want to say about I am Anne Frank? Um, I just love the idea of bringing in Anne Frank. It's so close to being horribly offensive. And I think it, yes. the show walks the line of not making it that. And just mm-hmm. like, yeah, I, I really like what what a what a show. What a show. I mean, it's it's an audacious move to be sure. And Joe, you're right at the beginning. Like, I think even if you've never seen the show before, I think you could watch this and it works perfectly as a standalone little movie. Yeah. I also like that it feels like it's actually paying off Arden as a character. He's not just a mad scientist. There's more to it than that. And it makes more sense as to why someone of his caliber, in quotation marks, as a doctor would be attracted to a place like Briarcliff because he's got access to vulnerable at-risk people that he can just murder and torture and just throw their bodies away into the woods and nobody gives a shit. And we didn't really touch on Jessica Lang very much, but I actually do think that she is fantastic in this season in general, but in these episodes, like the, there are more moments of humanizing her outside of like, you know, her crazy villain that she's introduced in the, in the beginning. But I do, I do love the exchange between her and um, Lily Ray whenever Lily Ray picks like the cane and she's like, I don't know what's gotten into you, sister, but it's a marked improvement. So good. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Emily, the line that both you and I brought up in our reviews for these episodes was when <laughs> she chastises Kit and Grace for having sex in the bakery. And she says, do you want to make a murder baby? <laughs> <laughs> It's the kind of line that only Jessica Lang can deliver. Oh, for sure. I do want to make a murder baby. But that is... <laughs> I cannot become pregnant, alas. But I would love to become pregnant with a murder baby. God, Satan, if you're listening. Right. Let's make it happen. A little Christmas wish. Put it yeah. out into the universe. <laughs> I wonder if that's also foreshadowing the fact that there will be a murder baby to come later on in this season. I mean, we kind of got that with Apocalypse and the Antichrist. True. Yep. Okay, so our other episode, which I feel like we're going to have slightly less to talk about, but is a little more seasonally appropriate, is episode eight, which is Unholy Night. Christmas carols everywhere, all over the fucking thing. Well, it was a nice change of pace from that fucking Dominique soundtrack that we get <laughs> to listen to. Dominique, <laughs> Dominique. <laughs> I need like a like a master's thesis on why that particular song. Is it just because it's so fucking annoying? I didn't read the actual thing. Uh, it, uh, Jean Decker, singer of the song Dominique, heard in season two, Asylum, was mocked in French-speaking countries for her chorus, where she repeats three times the end of the name Dominique, talking of Saint Dominic. In French, she was using a very bad slang swear word to say that Dominique is having sex, making the joke on her even worse, as the singer was a nun at the time of release. Ah, oh, there you go. Okay, so sexy nun. Yes. It tracks. That's about it. That's it. Okay, cool. Well, my my review of Unholy Night is a lot shorter. Basically, what people need to know is in between episodes five and eight, both Shelley and Grace have died. Grace will come back. Spoiler alert. Because <laughs> it's American fucking horror story. <laughs> uh, Lana has been raped by Threadson and she has escaped, but then she gets hit by a car. So she's brought back to Briarcliff. Ugh. And then Kit has also escaped police custody and he has returned to the asylum in an attempt to free Grace. So Unholy Night is another standalone story. Uh, a lot of it concerns Lee Emerson, who's played by Ian McShane, which is a great get. So I had never seen, I just started watching Deadwood earlier this year. So I didn't have any connection to Ian McShane when I watched this the first time. And I will tell you, <laughs> after watching two seasons of Deadwood and then watching this, it was, um, whew, it was, uh, it was interesting little feeling. But it feels like he's a good casting choice for it, right? Yes. <laughs> Missing some of his colorful scary. language, but yes. He was great. Like, I want him to play Santa Claus in everything now. You know how Ed Asner has just kind of become Santa Claus? Uh, <laughs> Ian McShane should always play Santa Claus, and he should always be, like, kind of scary. If we get a remake of Christmas Evil, that's right. your Ian McShane character. I think that's one of the things that I really like about this episode is that it feels like it could have come from the 1980s back when they were making inappropriate murderous Santa Claus movies. <laughs> that subgenre? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Just basically populated with what, like two or three films? <laughs> yeah. Every Silent Night, Deadly Night, and <laughs> Christmas Evil. Um, okay, so one important thing to note about this character is that he has a weird Jean Valjean storyline. So he stole a loaf of bread and then he went to jail. But unlike Les Mis, he was then gang raped by five men. And Tracy, you missed this when you were watching this episode? I missed it. <laughs> so Joe was telling me about this today and I was like, wait, when was that announced? I did not catch that at all. So I, I don't know how I missed that. But yeah, so he was gang raped by a bunch of men. Yeah, and then, of course, he turns into Killer Santa. So this is one of those things where I debate whether or not Ryan Murphy is a true... Is he a supporter of the queer community? Because why would you have a story like this in here? Kind of like you said, Emily, where he, he has this lesbian couple, but then he immediately kills one of them so that we can get the lesbian tragedy that always happens. This is the guy who gets raped and then, of course, becomes a killer. Why do we need these stories? Somebody was talking on Twitter today about how everything you read, my good friend Caroline Framke was talking about this, everything you read about Pete Buttigieg makes the politician seem like it's his origin story. And I'm like, yeah, that tracks. Pete Buttigieg as a character in a Ryan Murphy series makes too much sense. And like, I think even I would hope his supporters would admit that. Yeah, he would fit right in in cult, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Thank all about. you for saying it. I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> well, I'm a Canadian, so I can say offensive <laughs> things. <laughs> Wait, am I not allowed back in your country now? <laughs> I, it's fine. It's fine. 
Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm not in love with Lee Emerson's backstory because I find it kind of blatantly offensive, but, uh, that's fine. Really. It's Ian McShane, Ian McShaning all over the place. And all we need to really know about this is that he gets used as a pawn by sister Mary Eunice, who we have not talked about enough, who's played by Lily Rabe. She's amazing in this so entire season. So good in this. Like, I, I forgot how fun she is. I mean, you know, for being a possessed evil nun. Well, I mean, I think that's probably part of the reason why she's so much fun. <laughs> Everyone should get to be a possessed evil nut. If um, only. Yeah. All right. I, I like, I would love to try that someday. <laughs> Again, God, if you're listening, Satan, if you're listening, let's make this happen. You're just like calling up the four corners here, Emily. You're looking for all <laughs> kinds of evil divination to come down for the holidays, aren't you? I'm in my own season of American Horror Story. <laughs> <laughs> American Horror Story, A Very Trans Christmas. Nice. I mean, it could happen. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really know why it was necessary to have that bit of backstory for him. Like, it's, it's not necessary, actually. I mean, I, I'm not really a fan of using the word necessary any, with anything, because it's just right. like, eh, whatever. But it does seem like it's just contributing to a very bad stereotype that we've just got. I mean, even when we did the X-Files movie sequel a couple weeks ago, like, you know, it's, it's just... I don't know whether it's like, oh, getting raped or sexually assaulted by a man like makes you gay or makes you a killer or makes you insane. Like, it's just, I don't know why that was included here. And it's troubling. Uh, I'm glad that I missed it on the first viewing because it was apparently a throwaway line. I'm going to chalk it up to that and not me being inattentive. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. Oh, also, though, it's important to James Wong wrote this. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. Final Destination 3 and 1 and 3 and X-Files man James Wong wrote yeah. this episode. Yeah. So it's his fault is what you're saying. <laughs> he talked to me for my X-Files book and he was very informative and friendly. Thank you, James Wong. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> 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 um but also though directed by michael lemon the director of heathers which is also i perfect. was shocked <laughs> to see but yes a perfect fit mm -hmm. that i think is the thing that surprises me the most and it's the thing that i take away from every season of american horror story is whether i like it or hate it i do have to respect the fact that ryan murphy is pulling in unexpected choices in front of and behind the camera. He's giving opportunities to a variety of actors that we might not normally see in this type of really high-level production. Like, FX throws a shit ton of money at American Horror Story every year and just lets him do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah. So it is impressive. I just, then, you know, you see the way that he treats his characters, he treats his women, he treats his queer community members, and it's often these kind of not flattering representations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like... Oh, God, this may be way too far of a tangent. Please draw me back to this. As a trans person, like, the storytelling around trans characters... Because mm -hmm. there have been a few. Yeah, there have been a few. It's, like, never, like... I, I never feel like super offended by it outside of of course pose like pose is pretty good across the board but like mm -hmm. yes you know there was a storyline about the dot marie jones character being a trans guy in glee and it just was like yeah right i wasn't sure a why it was happening beyond just like it felt like somebody involved in the show had read a newspaper headline about the trans moment and was like well we need a trans character and like mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I do want more trans representation on TV, but it does feel like these shows almost always lean into the clumsiest version of it. And granted, mm -hmm. that doesn't really apply here, but... It's like very much like South Park in that regard, you know? Like, it seems like Ryan Murphy gets wind of something that is, like, you know, making waves in the headlines, like you said, like a newspaper headline, and it's, oh, let's get that into the, the show as quickly as possible, but not think about it or give it any sort of, like, nuance. It's just, like, let's get it in there. And maybe that rushed production mindset is what causes it? I'm not really sure. I love you saying, I love us talking about him reading the newspaper, because I'm imagining him with his LA Times, <laughs> like, reading the newspaper over breakfast, and he sees a headline, he folds it up, and he shouts at Brad Felchuk, who's, like, sitting at a typewriter, and it's like, take this down! Right. He's like, I've got to beat Greg Berlanti. <laughs> yes. The battle of the power, the power gaze in Hollywood, right? Oh, my God. But you know what, though? Greg Berlanti's doing great work on the CW, so I don't think there's been very many offensive things on his shows. 
He's, I think, a little bit more politically savvy when it comes to that. But yeah. <laughs> um, thinking about, actually, just because we've got you here, Emily, and because we've got just a couple more minutes, I do wonder, thinking about the best trans character in the Ryan Murphy universe, is it Famke Jansen's character from Nip Tuck? Because she gets a full fucking arc, right? But she's um, also like a bit of a pedophile, is she not? Because she goes after what's his name's son. Yeah, but she's also played by a cis woman, and just like yeah, you know, points mm. off for that, which he does with Liz Taylor in Hotel as well. Yeah, I remember the the reveal of her because it, it, it it's played as a twist. I I really, I mean, I love that season of Nitalk. I think that's the show's best season personally, and it dips hard after that. Oh, but. God. It does bother me when, like, the identity of a trans person is, like, revealed as a twist, as a narrative plot twist in a show. And yes. that's very much what happens in Nip Tuck. Oh, God, I shouldn't have said I was trans early in this episode. I could have made it a twist right now. <laughs> that would have been Surprise, so bitches. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, obviously we have, if we're discounting Pose, because I think Pose, again, like legitimately oh, yeah. tries to tell stories about not just trans people, but trans people of color in mm -hmm. a way that television rarely has. Yeah, I wonder who has been, maybe like, maybe fucking unique on Glee? I don't know, you know? Oh, wow. Okay. I'd have to think about it for a while. I'm sure that I'm missing somebody. But yeah, it's like once you get past Pose, then it's just like, yeah, a lot of twists or cis actors playing trans people or any number of things so mm -hmm. yay yeah and like mm -hmm. granted uh ryan murphy was learning along with the rest of us about trans identities in real time throughout the 2010s True. i don't hold yeah. this against him because like i do think he legitimately was trying most of the time there just definitely is an air of i gotta get me one of them trans people in here right <laughs> it's like a pokemon i mean ever ever since we started this podcast or our article series like it's I feel like a lot of times in the non-queer community, people think that all queer people know everything about all aspects of queerness, and that's very much not the case. Well, don't we also all know each other? Yeah. We have a phone tree, right? <laughs> when I came out, and literally I just said to my therapist, I think I'm trans, uh, the next day I had a directory in the mail with everybody's phone number. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you got your little like membership card. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. You got your trans card. <laughs> okay. I'm mindful of our time. Emily, I know that you have a hard exit. So I want to quickly get to our game for the episode, which we can Perfect. do in about two minutes and then we can wrap up. Okay. Great. So as we've talked about Ryan Murphy, he's got a great ensemble group of people that he loves to work with. He brings them back in all different kinds of roles. I would like to know from each of you one to two actors who you would like to invite into the Ryan Murphy troop of actors. Mm. Okay, I got I got one. Okay. Constance Wu. Oh. Okay. He's piss poor at Asian representation, so that yeah. would be a good start. <laughs> Ryan, yeah, Ryan Murphy doesn't have a ton of Asian representation. She definitely can play both super serious stuff and super campy stuff, and like that is the kind right. of actor he tends to work with well. I feel like Constance Wu and Ryan Murphy, like 10 years from now, they're going to be making beautiful music together. Okay. I I'll like it. That. It's unexpected. I, hey, I, I don't have a fun choice, but one of the supporting roles that really impressed me this year from an actress who I think is kind of vanilla on the show she's on is um, Lily Reinhardt from Riverdale, who oh, okay. turns in a very good performance in Hustlers. And Joe, as you know, I like to see quote unquote good girl actresses like, Go bad. Yeah. Go bad. She's the Selena Gomez in Spring Breakers of Hustlers, but <laughs> but she like handles herself very well amidst all the chaos. And so I kind of would like to see her get like her her finger is a little dirty with uh, a Ryan Murphy show. Right. Yeah. Take that Riverdale to the logical extreme. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I stopped watching Riverdale like a season and a half ago, so I can't really comment on what it's like now. But I didn't like it when I left it. No. Huh. Which again, I find strange considering I know. how much you love Scream Queens and other weird shit. Scream Queens is funny. One day we'll watch <laughs> it. <clears throat> Agree to disagree. We'll do Scream Queens for an episode one day. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. My pick, I cheated up because I created the question, so I just came up with a couple of options for myself. So I like what he does with rescuing older actresses from obscurity or when they haven't been doing much. So my pick for an older actress was Angelica Houston. Okay. Oh. I like Because I think she could like go toe to toe with somebody like a Jessica Lang or she could school Sarah Paulson or somebody like that. He would put that eyebrow to good use. Right. 
especially if he ever does like a, a proper vampire series that doesn't you know have lady gaga as your lead <sighs> actress yeah anyway anyway i'm not trying to upset the haters little monsters you're fine whatever Oscar mm-hmm. nominee Lady Gaga, please. Don't even with me. Golden Emily. Globe winner Don't. Robin Kirsten Dunst of no. her glory, Lady no. Gaga. No. Mm-mm. No. Uh, okay. And then my fun pick, who I think would be a total perfect fit, is Janelle Monet. Oh, yeah. I go for that. Because she gets into acting, but she always plays serious roles in acting. So I want to see her cut loose and be, like, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm into that. Well, I mean, we're, we're reaching the end. So, Emily, did you have anything you wanted to plug before you left us? I'm still trying. I'm trying to think of a guy who would be good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I we all picked women. <laughs> this literally just came to me. I genuinely think Woody Harrelson would be really good in a Ryan Murphy thing. I don't huh. know why I think this. I just feel like he'd, he'd get the vibe. He doesn't do a lot of comedy, but he's very funny when he does. Yeah. yeah. Woody Harrelson. I think it would work. Okay. Anyway, I do have things to plug. <laughs> uh, I am on Twitter at TVOTI, twitter.com slash Tivoti. Uh, you can find my writing at Vox. You can buy my book, X Files Monsters of the Week, the complete critical companion to the X Files, and it features reviews of every single episode. Oh my God. You can listen to my podcast, Prime Time, which is about the history of television. That's available through Vox. And then I have a podcast called Arden. It is a fictional true crime show about two women trying to solve the mystery of a disappeared Hollywood starlet. But also, clearly, they want to start kissing each other because I wrote it. So those are all the things you can listen to. They're all linked to on my Twitter, which is, again, twitter.com slash T-V-O-T-I. Awesome. I've heard really good things about Arden. It's, you know, one of the greatest shows ever made. (laughs) <laughs> like All right. right up there right up there with american horror story asylum <laughs> you're, you're, you know what you know what i'm i'm kidding because that like i'm the person who sees all the flaws in everything i do but i will say this arden is better than american horror story coven and but yep that's i'll do that i'll say that i will stand behind that okay put it out into the world everybody this is what <laughs> <laughs> this is what emily's saying <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much i had so much fun Yes, thank you so much, Emily. We really appreciated it. Yeah. Great. Uh, it was so great to have Emily join us for that. I'm really thankful she was able to come. I know. I was really happy. I'm telling you, I am I read her reviews constantly. I, I still read AV Club's TV reviews, like, all the time. They have severely cut back on their TV reviews, like, the number of shows that they write about. Yeah. Because, like, yeah, I think they got bought out or something. But the, 2012 was, like, the heyday of AV Club, TV Club. And I read all that shit for all the shows that I watched. I know. It was fun to go back and reread it and be like, oh, we're going to actually be talking to the person who wrote this because <laughs> I fully remembered reading those seven years ago. Yeah, as did I. But yeah, she has departed us now. I mean, not like she hasn't departed life. She's alive. Oh, my but... God. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, all of her Satan inc- incantations came true and she has ascended this plane. <laughs> yes. OK, but no, we, we will wrap up. I'm going to go through some housekeeping really quick to end the year. Um, so yes, everyone, if you want to reach me on Twitter, you can reach me at Traced Thurman. And I am at B Stole My Remote. That's the letter B. And if you're tweeting about the podcast, please be sure to use the hashtag HorrorQueers in your tweets. You can also email us at HorrorQueers at gmail.com or check out our Facebook group. Also, coming in the new year, we will actually have a Twitter profile for Horror <gasps> Queers. Yes, I know. we're doing it. We're committing. So now you can just fucking tag Horror Queers and not use the fucking hashtag all the time. But... You can still use the hashtag and tag us. It's totally fine. Yeah. Trace loves getting tagged. What? Tag teamed. Uh, getting tagged. Right. Teamed. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, look for that um, around January 1st. But if you have two seconds, please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating or a review. Christmas is in a week. It is seven days if you were listening to this on release day. And we would seven really appreciate days. some good reviews. I know. <laughs> <laughs> And um, we discussed this at the beginning of the episode, but if you do want more content, if you are traveling and you need more podcasts of us to listen to, because you've listened to all 53 of mm-hmm. our episodes, I think it's 53, yep. um, please head over to patreon.com slash horrorqueers, sign up for one of our tiers. We have so many minisodes and full-length episodes, and this month, right now, we already have one on Black Christmas, and mm-hmm. we will have one in just over a week on the new Into the Dark episode, Midnight Kiss, which is a very, very gay slasher film directed by Carter Smith, who guessed it on our People Under the Stairs episode. Mm-hmm. We've already seen it. We've already recorded it. That is some gay ass shit, people. You do not want to miss out on that. It's super gay. We've already seen it. It's great. Joe, we aren't covering anything next week, 
and we're not really covering something in two weeks. So yeah, everyone, we're taking Christmas off, so we will not have a new episode next week. But Joe, on New Year's Day, which is the next mm-hmm. Wednesday, an episode drop, what are we going to talk about? So we have teased this. We have made a request for people to send us things back at the beginning of the month. We are revisiting our original first episode, and we're going to go back to speed dating. So you and I obviously know each other pretty well at this point. So we have collected people's questions that they sent us, and we're also going to be drawing on those surveys that we asked you to fill out in November. So we're going to talk about the state of the podcast, what's working, what isn't working. We're going to address uh, your feedback, and we're going to do some listener questions. And listen, fuckers, if you are like, it's not about a movie, I don't want to listen to it. Don't do that. Don't be stupid. Just listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> we promise we will keep it interesting and it'll be worth your time. Basically, the first speed dating, our pilot episode was Joe and I speed dating. Consider this next episode of speed dating as y'all speed dating with us on a double date. Or a single mm-hmm. date. I guess it's us. Like, you're dating both of us. You're on a date with both of us. Um, we're going to make it really roulette. fun. <laughs> and there may be sex talk in it, too. I don't know. Oh, my God. People... Yeah. The people want to know. <laughs> the people have a right to know. <laughs> to, that's, that should be our... Oh, oh, and yes, uh, make sure you listen to it to hear our new theme song-ish thing. <laughs> yes, we're going to have a new opener. It's madness, y'all. We've got so many new things to announce. 2020 is going to be great, and I'm excited to take a week off and then kick it old school with you and revisit the speed dating. Yes. So uh, on that note, we can cross out American Horror Story Asylum and cross out 2019. Jesus, yes. And cross out horror queers. Disgusting Podcast Network, home of creepy, disturbing, and terrifying creepy pastas, SCP archives, weekly full cast storytelling, Sephora queers, genre commentary from an LGBTQ perspective, and the Boo Crew. Horror centric interviews. Listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts. Get in, losers. This is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all. Would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. Yet. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. <laughs> listen to Regarding Dracula wherever you listen to podcasts, or find us online at bloody.fm.